Well, we've been going really heavy in the book of Romans chapter 9. We've been talking a lot about the doctrines of rejection, election. We've been talking about how this all works out. And I have hammered a lot on many things, specifically what we could be talking about this morning. So what I'm going to do is take a little bit of a different approach because there's, there's no need to consistently go over again and again and again some of the things that we have been discussing. One, I don't want to bring you to a place of sheer exhaustion. I don't want you to be so overwhelmed by what we're talking about that we cannot comprehend it. Because last week was a very heavy, heavy sermon theologically. And my prayer has been each and every one of you, either in person or who watch online, that you've taken the last week to reflect on the greatness of what we have been discussing, specifically in chapter 8 and chapter 9 of this wonderful, wonderful book of Romans. I mean, the declaration is being made, and it, it's hard to understand, it's hard to comprehend, but the reality is God will have mercy on whom he desires, and he will harden to whom he desires. And when we hear this language, a list of questions rise up. We want to know what's going on, we want to know how to put all this together. And so last week I was very clear, and I want to remind us again this morning, It's okay to question and to have struggles with Holy Scripture. That is proper, and that is why we do Bible study. But it's another thing to attack Scripture and to accuse Scripture or to put something on Scripture that doesn't belong. And so hopefully, as you're doing your Bible study, as you've been reading, those are the things that you have been working through, because this is where we are even in our text yet again. How can God find fault? If it's all God who brings about election, if it's God who brings about salvation, how can God find fault? Who can resist God's will? And then we actually ended last week by dealing with this first major question. And it was the question of who are you to answer back to God? That is a heavy question. We looked through the book of Job to deal with the application point for that because as people we need to understand our place that we never answer back to God. We do not challenge God. We do not question God on what he does. And so the Apostle Paul in this wonderful letter caused us then to get into a reflection point on who we are and who God is. And as the question was being unpacked by the apostle, it's like, can the molded ask the molder? Now, I hope you picked up on that. You underlined it in your Bibles because it's important. It's an important aspect of what the apostle Paul is trying to say to the audience. And that lands us exactly where we are this morning in verse 21. Does not the potter have right over the clay? To make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another one for common use? Or some of your translations will say dishonor? The answer is going to be revealed. It's in Holy Scripture. But when we read verse 21, we still have to stop and pause as we do Bible study, as we're working through these things. And the first question is, why is Paul making a reference to this clay, to what is being molded to the molder? What is happening here, and why is he deciding to talk about Christians or talk about God's people as clay? And there's a reason for it. As we know, he was a Pharisee. We know that he was a missionary. We know that he was a tent maker. So the Apostle Paul could use multiple different um, images here to get his point across. And we want to go, okay, maybe, Paul, why didn't you talk about leather? Why didn't you talk about sewing a tent together to make this example so that we can understand what you're driving at? But he doesn't do that. Paul uses this image of clay. Do you know why he makes that reference of clay? Because it's an Old Testament image. Paul's not the first one to come about with this image of both potter and clay. In fact, one of the Old Testament references can be found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. And all of us are the work of your hand. And so we start to get the image of this understanding that it is God who forms us and makes us. He is the one who creates. He is the one into which we belong in his hands. 
Now, it's an interesting reference because it's the declaration of being in the hand of God. That means the imago Dei, those who are created in the image of God, as individuals, we do come in the same context of what's being spoken about in Isaiah with Israel as a nation. Because when you talk about Israel as a nation, in Scripture, we are talking about God's chosen people. And so we can get this understanding then that we are in the hands of God and God can do what He wants to how He wants. And if you carry that thought forward, we even know that salvation for all people without distinction, both to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, from all corners of the earth are in the hands of our God. And so we go back to Romans 9.21. We have to deal with that issue of fairness again. We have to come back to this issue of rejection and election. Don't forget, the church in Rome was filled with new converts, and many of those converts were once Jewish. They are now Christian. You have to remember the Judaizers are coming behind the Apostle Paul and what he is saying. They are attacking the gospel of grace. They're bringing in the fact that you need to have circumcision and everything else First, you must be a Jew in order to be a Christian, and he has to deal with this. And again, we come back to the issue, and it's the continual thought to what the apostle has been talking about. Is there any injustice on God's part? This is the the issue he is still handling. And so what Paul does, he brings their mind back. And don't forget, first century Jewish people were not like us. The scribes and the Pharisees, they knew the books. They had it memorized. They knew what was going on. And so when Paul's about to drop that little statement about the clay and the potter, their minds would have gone back historically. And that's what we're going to do quickly by looking at Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 10. So if you want to turn your Bibles to Jeremiah 18, 1 through 10. I find it quite interesting, actually. This is what it says. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there was making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel, as it pleased the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as the potter does, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O Israel. That's interesting. At the moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring upon it. Or at another moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good with which I had promised to bless. So the context in Jeremiah is clearly dealing with these two kingdoms. We know what is happening. If you don't know the scriptures that well, go back, read the book of Jeremiah, understand that there's this issue of two kingdoms here. But what's important for us this morning is the context that we understand the potter can do what he so desires with the clay. This is what Jeremiah is being told, that God alone is the potter and he can make rise or he can uh, allow to fall any nation he so desires and that is what verses 1 through 6 of Jeremiah is getting at God as the potter does as he pleases and though he does things in our eyes that may seem unjust or not right God is never unjust it is always right God is always right he is always true his way is always proper and we see this then in the matter of the destruction of what he's talking about in Jeremiah by sin. Because even though we as Christians often get focused on the negative of Scripture, the aspect of what's actually being said is mercy. 
We start to see that though there is idolatry, and though Judah and Jerusalem are going after idols, and they're doing all sorts of things, it is still about mercy. God is the one who decides by his gracious ways to extend mercy on individuals. So when you take that and you bring it back to Romans, and we start to, get, start to understand something a little bit better. Because what Paul was saying is about the clay being in the hands of the potter. We start going into this issue then. Let me just turn back there for a moment to verse um, 19. And I'll go on a little, um, excuse me, verse 20, 21. On the contrary, who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will the thing molded say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Or does the potter have... um, Or does not the potter have authority over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel of honorable use and another for dishonorable use? We can see from the reference of Jeremiah that something is taking place. Now the the potter in Jeremiah's case, we start to learn that the clay is indeed subject to being in the hands of the potter. Have you ever asked yourself, what can spoil clay? Have you ever looked at the, the composition of clay? I did it for this, uh, this sermon. I thought, I'm going to put it in there. Then I went completely sideways. I got lost, so I took it out. But it's quite amazing. In fact, if you have a little pebble, a little bit of impurity in that clay, the clay needs to be completely broken down. It's that serious. Anything in the, in the potter's clay that is not right as they're forming it will if basically attack the integrity of that clay. Clay also needs to be prepared. That way all the stones and all the dirt and everything else can be taken out of it. But clay also has to have a certain moisture aspect. Did you know that? So if clay is hard, it cannot be formed. It's kind of interesting, right? Why does God break people? Because they're hard of heart. But clay needs to be soft. And then it's on the wheel, and you start thinking about the potter's wheel. As the wheel's going around, that potter can take their hands, and they can bring it up to a vase. They can put their little fingernail and make a little design, or they can put pressure on the top and completely destroy it. It's an amazing thing. And the, when you look at that, then, as they're building it, if a little rock goes in, if something's not right with the integrity of that clay, they might go, I'm going to be making this most beautiful pot so I can sell it so somebody could put the rice in it. And they're like, it, you know what? It's got stones in it. Or the integrity of the clay is not right. They put it off to the side for dishonorable use. Here, I'll sell it to you for a buck. But the other one that's perfect and right and pure and proper, the potter can take that and sell it for more money. Hold on to that, because clay is clay. Clay cannot do anything but be clay. It can't stop being clay. It has no control if there's rocks in it. It can't stop impurities from coming in. It is simply dirt. And what we realize then, our position in this whole thing of who we are and how God raises people, lowers people, raises nations, lowers uh, nations, it is God who forms because God is the potter and therefore God alone having authority does as he wishes when he sees the clay in any way that we cannot see it. So you take that from the Jeremiah reference, he can certainly make those nations And he can do what he wants according to his grace. And if he can do that with a nation, we cannot dare say he can't do that with a person. So Jeremiah chapter 18 verse 6. Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as the potter does? That's a reference. It's a reference to God's divine authority. His sovereign authority. Israel is in his hands. Christians You are in the hands of God. Every person on this planet is in the hands of God. And he will do so as he wishes in accordance to his ways. And that is what he's getting across when he's talking about the molded, the molder and the clay and the potter. He is letting everyone know that it does not matter if it's Jew or Gentile. Two separate nations. Don't forget the message on uh, the privilege, the blindness of privilege. Jew, Gentile coming in together. 
Remember what it says in Psalm 115, 3, but our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Psalm 103, 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Therefore, his sovereignty is not just over just Israel, but all nations, all of us, Jew and Gentile, all without distinction, just like the potter has control over the entire part of the clay. This is what it's getting at. And so when God is dealing with us, he can make vessels of honor and dishonor, vessels that are profitable and not profitable. But here's the thing. Even if your eyes can't see it, all clay is subject to the potter's hand. And all who ever have breath or do have breath or will have breath are subject and are required to yield to God. With his hand alone, he chose to make a valley, it's done. By his own power, if he decides to make the earth shake, it is done. Only God can change the course of a river, and only God can change the heart of man. Likewise, the potter, if he desires to make a bedpan, he will make a bedpan. And he will get praise for that bedpan. Just as much if he decides to make the most beautifully crafted vase, he will still get praise the honor. But here's the thing, the bedpan can't boast and neither can the vase. It's impossible. Christians, we need to learn this because so many Christians, we boast about our salvation. We boast about who we are. We boast about our ministries. We boast about everything. Only Christ may boast. So we tie all that in with Romans 9.21. We can make the application and the connection of the two kingdoms, as I said, the people of God and the non-people of God, the elect and the ones who reject. It never goes about any other way. Hope this makes sense, because there's a lot here. But the reference point of what's taking place, the connection that we want, is this. Can you imagine being in first century Rome? Can you imagine being a, a Jew and reading what is taking place, and all of a sudden you hear this image of clay and potter and molded, your mind's going to get sparked. Your mind's going to get sparked that something's going on here. If you're a scribe, a Pharisee, or a Sadducee, it's going to cause you to reflect that God is doing something here. That Paul is saying these words It's like, okay, what is God doing here? Because it's not the first time that God has spoken to one of his people about this issue of clay. And that's where we find ourselves. Back to 22 and 24. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath, to make his power known, endured with much patience, Vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom we also are called, not among the Jews only, but also from amongst the Gentiles. It's making sense to this audience. You know, there's a clip that's being widely circulated all over the internet. And if you're in the Reformed camp, you know what I'm going to be talking about here. But when people are reading Romans chapter 9, they often look at only the negative aspects of the chapter. Hold on a second. How dare God do this? Why doesn't God save everybody? Who does he think he is? Why is God so harsh? Why is God so unjust? And And humanity puts on all these negative things with God. And this is not the first time. So there's a dear brother who has gone home to the Lord and at a Ligonier conference that is filled with all kinds of people, he gets this question and unfortunately our dear brother Chris Larson has to ask the question. If God is so kind and patient, and of course he gets corrected because since God is kind and patient, then the question comes out, why was at the judgment and God's wrath on Adam and Eve so severe? And then our dear brother R.C., hearing that question, gets angry. He gets boiled in his blood, and he looks out at all the people attending. They spent a lot of money to be there, and he simply said, what's wrong with you people? That you would think God's just 
action and reaction to the fall is so severe. And the reason why he got boiled is because the people did not see mercy and grace in the fall of Adam and Eve of two people who deserve to die were given life. And the problem is, many people, when we read Romans chapter 9, we rightly deserve the same thing. We deserve to be told what's wrong with our thinking. What is wrong with our thinking when we lose track that the sovereign God has a right to do as he so wishes over the clay? He has every right to save some and not save others. He hasn't asked for your permission. He hasn't asked for your acceptance on that. He is simply telling you that he is God. This is the way it is, and we are supposed to then accept it. It's hard, isn't it? But that's what divine sovereignty is. And when we're dealing with the text now, it's not negative. We can't look at it, well, what do you mean he gets right over the clay to make a vessel of honor? Who is he to make a vessel of dishonor? And the Christian's response is, oh my goodness. He makes a vessel of honor? He can take the clay? that is corrupt and polluted and gross and filled with every aspect of impurity and clean it and purify it and even make any vessel of honor in the first place? You see, it's focus. It's perspective. And so many Christians lose this. From verse 22 down to verse 29, my friends, you are reading the expression of God's divine mercy on how he saves individuals. And I dread that so many people miss it when they're trying to argue the word of God. Remember something, Psalm 145, 9, the Lord is good to all and his mercies are over all his work. And so when we read this, what if God wanting to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known endured with much patience vessels of wrath having been prepared for destruction and in order that he may make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy. Dear friends, you don't know what you're saved from unless you know what the law is. You don't know how far you've walked until you compare where you are now to this fallen corrupt world. You don't know how much God loves you until you see what rightly deserves those who are against him. It's all about mercy. And his mercy is evident by the fact that those who deserved wrath, he still withheld it. When you see people cuss God out and live a life of absolute blasphemous disgust, It's God's grace and mercy upon them why they haven't been struck down. He endured with much patience for both the Jew and the Gentile. Those polytheists, those ones who are having all the the drunken orgies and bowing down to all these gods and attacking the Christians. They were vessels of wrath at one point, but now they're coming in to this family of God. It's all about mercy. It's all about grace. It's all about restoration. It's all about salvation for all without distinction. So you go back to verse 22. Again, what if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath, to make his power known, endured with much patience, don't lose the word patience, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. The Greek is interesting here. It's very interesting because what is being said is what if God is willing? There's a little word in the Greek and it's da. You all have in your Bibles probably the same as mine the word what and what or what if. But the Greek word's not what. It's but. That's interesting. This, this little word but, and when you translate it, It makes a whole different aspect of the scripture. But if God is willing, means since he has chosen to do so. It means that this, since he has revealed it this way. 
it shows God's character. It shows that he is absolute. It shows that he is God and that he is final. And if I set it fast in the background, I hope you're paying attention this morning as I go slow. So hear me very carefully, okay? Jesus Christ will and is praised by all who are his. And he will receive praise and adoration and the heavens will celebrate for every single saint that goes before him in his presence because they are saved. And just as much he will be glorified and praised for every rotten sinner that is cast from his presence in hell for all of eternity. Make no mistake, friends. When you're in heaven and God's judgment is being poured out and for you younger folks who think your parents are going to be crying and nail biting and begging God so you can get into heaven, they will be praising him that he removed you from the presence of the saints. It's hard to understand but he is praised in salvation and he is praised in damnation. And he, in his perfect wisdom, in his perfect love, in his perfect grace, poured out to those whom he is going to save. I don't think we realize how much we have been saved from. I don't think we realize this extension of his long suffering. And you take all of that, you bring it down into connection of what we spoke about last week in verse 19. The Apostle Paul is asserting here that God alone can do as he wishes. And for us to understand that, he uses the potter. Because what I just said is no different than a potter to go, I don't like the way this is made. Get rid of it. This is impure. Get rid of it. And then there's this vase crafted over here. And for many, they look at it and go, that's not much. Until you look over here and look at that and go, ugh. Whoa. Wow. Oh my goodness. So we put all this together. His grace is amazing. His mercy is unending. The reason why grace can shine so bright is because it's on the backdrop of God's wrath. The, re the reason why you can fight sin and say no to it. You know when it's tempting you and it's calling you and it wants you to dive in. It just says, get rid of everything and just go after this sin. And you start thinking about the wrath and what we truly deserve and what we have been saved from. The most, I don't want to use that language, but i got no other way to say it. The most attractive sin ugh, is the most filthy sin. Because it's on the backdrop of God's wrath. When we see the reality of how God works and we start to understand this concept of the potter and the clay, there's no way that we can ever boast, nor do we think God owes us anything. If you were a millionaire, and you billionaire, and God saves you, and you are saved from your sin, and you lost everything, and you lost all of your wealth and your money and your cars, and you were living on the street as a destitute, you have more than you've ever had in your entire life. And God does not owe you a single thing. No one can boast that you are saved. If you boast that you picked Jesus, you are more prideful than I ever wish you were. <laughs> and when you look at somebody who's under the wrath of God, and you see their life, and you see what they're doing, it should cause you to weep, and it should cause you to evangelize, and to be mission-minded, and to call them to repentance in love. How do I know this? Our next verse, we go down. I just unpacked a bunch, but it looks like verse 25. As he says, also in Hosea, I will call those who are not my people my people, and her who is not my beloved, my beloved. Saints, can you get in your mind right now 
that the creator of the universe calls you his beloved? For those of you who are at the wedding on Friday, and I know who danced. We talked about this great marriage. You're his beloved. Have you ever let that truth hit you? Maybe not. That's why my job as a pastor is to cause reflection on this point this morning. You see, the book of Isaiah is all about judgment and restoration. It's a wonderful book, and it's got a lot of hard language in it. If you are easily offended by words such as whoredom or prostitution, you probably might want to make an extra coffee to get through it. But the Bible does not need to apologize because it shows you the severity of idolatry towards God. You see the heart of God when his people are moving off into all kinds of idolatrous relationships. But the book is all about God bringing his people back. Now this is important. Because Israel are people just like we are today. Israel, were, ancient Israel was wrapped up in their own ideas and their own reflection. They worshiped God the way they wanted to. Well, after all, I mean, I mean I'm God's. I could do what I want. I mean, God's not going to judge me. I can worship how I want. I can worship when I want. I don't need some pastor or some group of people telling me how I need to worship. In fact, Israel was not necessarily focused on God's sovereign plan either. But guess what? No matter how black or how bad or how thick the adultery was for Israel, God was still good. That's what this book talks about. The book of Hosea. It talks about this amazing promise of God. God's people did not walk as God's people. Just like Christians don't walk like Christians. God's people went after other gods because Yahweh was not satisfactory to them. Just like many Christians go after other gods because they're not satisfied in Jesus Christ. Israel was idolatrous just like the Christian church is idolatrous and they lived not like his chosen people just like Christians today don't live like his chosen people. No, that is serious. But God's promises to Israel and just like his promises to us he will restore them. To understand that, we're going to go back to chapter 1. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to do a very quick kind of synopsis. We know of going through chapter 1 that this prophet was to marry a prostitute. The Bible says harlotry. And the reason why he was to marry Gomer is because Israel was prostituting themselves to these fake gods. They forsook all the commandments of God. So here he is with a wife. She's a prostitute. And they have a son. The son's name is Jezreel. It's not a good name, folks. For you who might be thinking of having a family, don't call your, your son Jezreel. It symbolizes a degenerate Israel. It's Israel's new name. When you study the book carefully, Israel could no longer boast of their heritage to Abraham. Israel no longer had any honor. The name represents a new name for Israel. It was once given to Jacob as now Israel. They are now Jezreel. A new identity because of their idolatry. It's an indictment that they are no longer Israelites. They are cursed and nothing more than Gentiles. Basically, that's a quick synopsis without going through the whole book. Then Hosea is to have a daughter. He could have called her like Becky, Karen, but no. Her name means I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel. Can you imagine if I gave my daughter this, like, this name? Man. Come here, you. Come on, Lohrama. Come on. What does my name mean, Daddy? It means you bring disgust to me. It's like, oh, I love you too, Daddy. This is a reference to his daughter that God freely chose Israel. That he extended his gracious adoption upon them in forbearance at one time. But no more. No more. His compassion has been removed. 
So now he's got these two kids, probably drive him nuts. Now it's the third daughter from this prostitute. I'm just giving you quick. His name, not my people. Can you imagine having a name like that? What's my name, Dad? It means not my son. And I am not your God. The third name represents a final disowning. Israel's already been given a new name. They've already been told they've been separated from God and disowned. They were no different than the Gentiles. And now you're not even my children. Think of an Islamic family when an Islamic daughter brings shame against her father and their mother or a son. And they literally, probably, you know, in disgust, say, you're dead to me. Leave. Go away. You're not my child. You have brought dishonor against me. Get out of here. And that's some fake religion that has nothing. Now, put that fakeness aside, and can you picture for a moment boasting that you are the chosen child of God, and here's the name from the prophet. You're not even my daughter or my son. You're done. That's the context of the book of Hosea. Judgment, restoration. So when you think about the names of disowning, of no longer having compassion, and you think about the meaning of those names that I have given you, in verse 23 of chapter 2, this is where the Apostle Paul calls out his quote back in Romans chapter 9, where it says, I will sow her for myself in the land. I will also have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion And I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. That's restoration. Can you picture yourself being a Jew reading this letter in Rome when this is being said? In short, Paul's like, Your rejection of the gospel is so disgusting that God cannot extend his mercy on you. You're not even a child of God. We've covered that. Not all of Abraham are of Abraham's. You're not even his child. And then he throws this out. And all of a sudden we are learning that they are no different than the Gentiles. And yet God's going to bring them all together. And the people who are not his people will be his people. And he will be their God. This is new covenant language. It's covenant language. Verse 19 is speaking of betrothment forever. There's an eschatological reference of what's going on here through all of eternity. And this restoration is not simply the way it always was for Israel. That's back to Hosea for a second. We've got to remember this. These promises of restoration was not, hey Israel, it's going to be the same as it always was. No, 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 no. It's going to be so much better. It's a new thing I'm doing. It's going to be far beyond you can ever comprehend. God is going to respond. God is going to respond in their restoration through providing a need, and the need is going to be the Messiah. And the Messiah is not just for Israel, for all people without distinction. Jew, Gentile, bond free, male, female. And that's the connection point in verse 25. God adopts and shows compassion once again to Israel, to the Jews. But he's saying, heads up, the Messiah that has come is not just for you. It's for all of them. It's for everyone. Now here's the thing, dear Christian. If you're sitting in these pews this morning and you think that Christ only came to save you from your sin and you're sitting there in arrogance and refusing to share with your neighbors or your friends or your family about the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ, or you think that somebody doesn't deserve your forgiveness or they don't deserve to hear the gospel, kind of acting like, you know, a Jonah, right? Saying they don't deserve the gospel. Oh my goodness, you're in trouble. Because this speaks of you. Because if God has chosen to extend his mercy and compassion to both Jew and Gentile for all without distinction upon his elect, then we better be out there sharing the gospel with every single person. That's what's taking place. This is what verse 25 is about in Romans chapter 9. The Jewish people wandered in all kinds of messy idolatry and therefore God brought them judgment upon them. Paul's saying your rights and privileges have been removed because you're rejecting the Messiah. You're no different than the Gentile. You're all on common ground here. 
all of you, we all need Christ. It's on the equal ground. That's the one. We should have sung that one. The cross is, what was that one you sing? The ground is love at the foot of the cross. Yeah, we should have sung that. But that's what it's getting at. God himself, through the Messiah, through Jesus Christ, is restoring his chosen people. And then Romans 9, 26, and it shall be that in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. All around the world, 150,000 people die every day. Dead, 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 dead. Going into a, a Christless eternity. And yet, he called you his sons and his daughters. Have you ever thought about that? How do we know we truly are his sons and daughters? Well, thankfully, the apostle Paul didn't just write a letter to Rome. He also wrote a letter to, to Ephesus. And in the opening of his letter, the first seven verses, it states this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed upon us in the beloved. There's your connection. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Friends, you were not always a child of God. He made you his child. He called you. He saved you. John 1.12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, to the Jew and to the Gentile. Galatians 3, 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Even our sisters, you are sons. You can say daughters if it makes you feel better. But in the context of the Old Testament and what Paul is driving here is we realize that he is the one, God is the one who not only judges, yes, and that's serious, but he also extends his mercy and it's based upon his free choice, not our free choice, but God's free choice. And in doing so, he is demonstrating a better way, a better covenant. It is through Christ. And if you can look back through the Old Testament all the way up into the New Covenant and you can see how everything unfolded, you are able to survive in this world because you know he is not done yet. Just as he told Hosea there's going to be restoration and a better day is coming, he has told us, the bride of Christ, that there is a better day coming as well. Our salvation is in Christ and it will be finalized and our faith will become sight when our Lord returns. But it was always spoken about in the prophets. In what we have read this morning in chapter 9, Paul is reminding Israel of their history, of their unfaithfulness, of their idolatry, and their need to repent, and that repentance is available, and restoration is available solely through the sacrificial lamb to whom we call Jesus Christ. And I am here as a pastor to say to you all that we too have wandered in all sorts of idolatry. We have wandered in all kinds of ways of getting our flesh gratified. We have neglected the promises of God. We have taken Holy Scripture and minimized it. And just as the promise is true for Israel and His chosen people, it is true for us as God's chosen people. There is restoration, there is forgiveness, and there is strength when we go and call upon the name of the Lord to heal us. And that was my purpose today. It wasn't to give an exhaustive history of the book of Jeremiah over the book of Hosea. It was to tell you that you and I don't deserve this thing. I'm almost certain almost everyone in this room is a Gentile. I, I don't know if anybody here is actually born truly Jewish. 
but yet here we are. If the Jews couldn't boast, we certainly can't boast. There is no boasting. Only God gets to boast. Because God is the one who's doing the restoration through his mercy and his grace. It's a lot of head knowledge, isn't it? One of the most dangerous doctrines is the doctrine of election because it causes a person to become arrogant and filled with all kinds of knowledge in their head while their heart becomes nothing more than a cold cistern of lack of works. And the problem with head knowledge is we think it makes us holy because we can articulate theology, but we certainly don't live it out. So let me just try to make one more application so when we leave here today, we're not leaving with a bunch of head knowledge, okay? Israel is showing that they had an incorrect view of God. That's what Paul's addressing, okay? Chapter 9. They had an incorrect view of God. Their rejection of grace, the rejection of the gospel showed that they didn't know who God was. They forgot him. Have you forgot him? Have you become the New Testament Jewish believer? When the truth of Scripture is testifying against you and you're absolutely rejecting it. They walked in adultery after other gods. And they took, a, they took for granted their position of right and privilege with Yahweh. And as I said, Christians do the same. There is forgiveness. There is forgiveness, dear friends. Absolutely, there's forgiveness in Jesus Christ. But you cannot, and I cannot, any Christian cannot simply go on living as if there is no rules. As if there is no requirements. As if there is no relationship. The Jews' hearts were cold towards God. I'm going to use this quick analogy and I'll wrap it up. So Christy and I will be married 21 years this October. Now, if in early in my marriage, if I simply ignored her when she wanted to talk to me by turning on the, the sports channel, and every time she wanted to go out for dinner, I just kind of ignored her. Every time she wanted to spend time with me, I just brushed her off. I'd either be dead or I'd be divorced. But why is it that when I say that, everyone would say, absolutely, you're a jerk. Why would you even treat your wife like that? But yet Christians do it all the time. We watch TV instead of praying. We watch sports instead of reading. We go hang out with our friends at the pool hall instead of meditating. We eat Doritos and watch hockey instead of evangelizing. We work on our careers instead of missions. Right? We serve more for worldly causes than we do to serve the own church. And it's possible, the reason why that is, because many people have forgotten God. And the Christian is resting on their right and their privilege of title, not in their relationship. And because of that, you have gone after other gods and if you can say, I haven't, well, then you are your own God that you have fashioned in your own life. And I'm here as a pastor to tell you, you will be held accountable. You will be judged. So will I. There is grace and mercy. We are cleansed by the blood of Christ, but we will be judged. Remember one thing. Mercy is God withholding what we do deserve, and grace is getting what we don't deserve. That was a wonderful statement by Adrian Rogers. So reflect on that. God extended mercy and grace to Israel, even though they were rejecting the wonderful message, just as he's doing that for you and I this morning. So let that sink into our hearts as we take everything that we've been learning over the last couple of weeks so that we can grow more into the image of Christ. Christ.